We even found maybe Peter's house in Mark 9, 1. Von Wallard writes, almost all scholars now espouse this view. So, I could go on and on and on. Uh, if you if you read Craig Blomberg's um, book on um, the atrocity of the Gospels, um, you will find time after time after time the Gospels get it right historically. I've tried. I've gone into depth on the Quirinius census. Uh, by the way, if you want to look at that, if you look at my videos on Jesus, uh, uh, Cambridge Companion to Jesus. But the point is that um, there's countless facts verified in the Gospels, historical facts, and minor details that people who are making things up wouldn't get correct. And there has to be an acknowledgement that there is historical accuracy within the Gospels. Now, there has been an unbalanced, an, in, an, an injustice and an imbalance concerning the Gospels. Since Paul, a lot of biblical scholarship and historical Jesus studies was influenced by post-enlightenment thinking and was anti-church, and so believed that it should get behind the Gospels and get to the true source material and it was to ignore the church's perspective on the Gospels. But what that did is it began to take apart intricately analyzing every bit and part of the Gospels, never accepting any of it as historically accurate. Now, because of the 1920s, when uh, Jew Jewish scholars wrote the lives of Jesus from a Jewish perspective, and that scholarship was discovered in the 1950s and 60s, it began to dawn on scholars that Rudolf Bultmann and the form critics were actually not correct in their assessment of the Gospels. Bultmann assessed that the Gospels were actually, uh, that the, he, he believed in Greek culture and that anything that was Jewish was not historically accurate. But because of the revival of Jewish scholarship in the 50s and 60s, Scholars realized Bultmann and the form critics were wrong that there was actually a Jewish context to the Gospels. What that did then, it made scholars realize there was actually more historical content within the Gospels than was given credence. My argument and, and contention against atheists and skeptics who would say that we look at the Gospels piecemeal, that is the historical method and that we look at every individual bit and assess it on its merits is not completely fair because we wouldn't do that with completely with ancient historians. There will be some ancient historians that are generally accurate and we'll take large chunks of what they're saying as accurate because we know that they would generally go and investigate and they would generally be be fair with their sources. We might be spot various biases, we might be able to spot indiscretion or compromises or whatever, but we'll have a general trust of an author or not. And I think the in injustice with the Gospels is since the Enlightenment there was a utter radical skepticism. And I think that Pendulum, that, that legacy is with us today and I think it has to change. I think there has to be a much more readiness to accept from the skeptics and from academics that the Gospels are generally trustworthy in the historical information. And if that's the case, it means you should be much more open to the data that is given about Jesus' miracles and about the resurrection. So it's a case of do you take a skeptical position or do you take a more of innocent till proven guilty? And I think the fair option 
in looking at the gospel documents is to say innocent till proven guilty rather than the radical skepticism that many skeptics use it's just a, a complete unfairness to the fact that we are finding continually the gospels as being accurate historically that's a very important point a nuanced point in this debate on did Jesus rise from the dead it is true to say that we look at detailed historical data on their own terms but it is also true to say that there are some writers that we know are more trustworthy than others and so the question has to be up as we look at the detailed information are these writers trustworthy or not that has to be answered and the skeptics quickly put that under the carpet and don't put it up for debate because if they did if the evidence goes one way it means it's the end of the debate for the skeptic now if we look at the Gnostic Gospels we can compare the difference between the four Gospels and we can find that when the Gospels mention um, for example in contrast we find the Gnostic texts do not anchor Jesus in historical time for example Pilate is not mentioned at all Galilee comes only once in the Gnostic text as for biblical Gospels Pilate appears about 60 times and I could go on and on and on about more information about that so the Gnostic Gospels show that they have no real historical integrity whatsoever then finally we find that the Gospels are rooted in eyewitness material Richard Balcom says it is the contention of this book that in the period up to the writing of the gospel gospel traditions were connected with the name and known eyewitnesses people who had heard the teaching of Jesus from Jesus from his lips and committed it to memory people who had witnessed the events of his ministry death resurrection and themselves had formulated the stories about these events that they told these eyewitnesses did not merely set going a process of oral transmission that soon went its own way without reference to them they remain throughout their lifetime a source that may have varied for figures of central and more marginal significance the authoritative guarantors of the stories they continue to tell Richard Balcom, Jesus and the eyewitnesses the gospel as eyewitnesses Grand Rapids Ehrman 2006 Uh, in Richard Balcom's book, uh, basically, he's challenging the form critics. The form critics would say, and a lot of skepticism would say, that Jesus developed as a myth by a competing number of storytellers, principally in the plural. There were these communities, who we don't know who they were, who wrote these stories about Jesus and that's how things developed in noting the historical research of Papias who's mentioned by Eusebius and Papias mentions that he talks to the daughters of Philip and tried to get eyewitness material about Jesus Christ Malcolm also notes in ancient bibliography uh, ancient historiography that since Polybius, uh, Polybius in 200 BC or maybe a bit more believed that if you're going to be a good historian you had to look at eyewitness material so based on these two researches one uh, Papias and Eusebius two uh, the research done on how ancient historians work uh, based on Burridge's book and also if you look at the four lectures of um, Dr. Balcom at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary on the Gospels as history you'll get an understanding of this debate so what you find is because of this research there's a strong case that the Gospels are based on eyewitness material you can see this in the Gospel of Mark and this is quoting 
uh, Richard Balcom. Mark writes in a similar way to historians of his time. He uses the narrative methods of inclusio, a historical method of his time. Peter is made central in this inclusio, which means it is was the eyewitness material being etc. You can go into in depth look at this in Richard Balcom's book. So basically I've provided a simple a couple of simple arguments. Number one, the gospels are in the first century. This is seen by the nineteen thousand quotes of the early church fathers from the second century. And so cannot be denied. We've seen secondly that based on the research of people like um, Richard Bauk, this material, and that we have to respect the authors as being trustworthy. We also saw that the resurrection in a, a large variety of uh, religious literature both from the first and second century have a consistent story of a Jesus dying and rising which points to a clear historical narrative that could not have been invented nor could have developed over time because there's so much cross-referencing of different historical documents religious documents So it's a broad argument. It's a broad argument that I'm bringing based on Balcom's book, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. So here's some of my other thoughts. In Mark chapter 14, verse 66 and 72, we know that the gospel is based on Peter's testimony. Why would Mark put in Peter's denial of Jesus if it did not happen? Also, why would Peter be a coward at the time of Jesus' death? So, Sorry, here's my conclusions of this evidence. We've given the depth of the evidence of the historical variety of the gospel, veracity of the denied witness. Now here's the conclusion of what, what that gives us, what that helps us on the table.